Hello friends, Pastor Terry Parks here and we are rolling into another episode of The Journey. And today I hope to finish up talking about the ministry gift of the prophet. And so the prophet is one of those gifts that has an expression in the Old Covenant as well as the New Covenant. And the Old Covenant term for prophet is the Hebrew term nabi, and the New Testament term for prophet in Greek is prophetes. And, and basically they both mean the same thing, and it's an, ex, it's an inspired speaker, an oracle of God, a seer, God's spokesperson. And so um, the prophetic gift is one of the foundational gifts of the New Testament. Um, Paul said that, you know, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets is the church being built. And so um, the, the foundational gift of the apostle and prophet should work very closely together. Um, Paul also said in 1 Corinthians that God gave first apostles, secondarily prophets, and third teachers. And so uh, the term first for apostles is a Greek term proton, which means first in rank and authority. Secondarily, prophet is the Greek term uh, deuteros, which means second in rank and authority. And third, teachers is the Greek term tritos, which means third in rank and authority. And so, and also these are third in progression. And so, so the New Testament expressions of the uh, the prophet that we talked about previously um, was the this the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy can happen anywhere that there's a prophetic environment that's created. Um, oftentimes it'll be associated with prophetic music, prophetic people. And so we see this first expressed in the Old Testament with the, the King Saul shortly after he was anointed to be the king. He got around a bunch of prophets and he got under this prophetic environment and began to prophesy himself. But also we see um, in Revelation chapter 19 where, G where the scripture says that the, the spirit, of, the, the spirit of, te of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And so the spirit of prophecy is an expression of the gift that really expresses the heart of Christ towards his people. The second expression of prophecy in the New Testament is the gift of prophecy that is listed amongst the nine spiritual gifts that are referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so... That is a gift that any spirit-filled believer can have and operate in. Edification, exhortation, and comfort, although it's not going to be just li limited to that. But that's kind of the, the realm that that operates in mostly. And then the third expression is the fivefold office of the prophet, which I believe is what Paul was referring to when he said secondarily prophets. And so the prophetic gift is a gift that foretells and foretells. So foretelling is prediction forth telling is declaration and so uh, but prophets function in many different realms and additional realms to that and there is no one way to be a prophet they come in every shape size color and form um, and so prophets uh, oftentimes they are seers they may see images pictures almost like a rolling movie and they'll express that in prophecy uh, some are dreamers some are interpreters of dreams some are musicians and some function through a prophetic musical gift that oftentimes brings the spirit of prophecy and many people will prophesy. Um, some are those who um, have gifts of inspiration, some have gifts of impartation, some have gifts of revelation, some have gifts of illumination. These are all areas that prophets can function in. Uh, some largely give confirmation. Uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the giftings of prophets today in my life, they're basically confirming what I've already known by the Spirit myself. Uh, some preach, some are terrible preachers, some you don't want to preach, some they just need to stay in their lane and in their function of prophesying. Uh, others will prophesy through song, uh, with prophetic new songs. And so the gift of prophecy manifests in the New Testament in many different ways, and it's, many of them are very reminiscent of the Old Testament expression of the prophet. And so in the Old Covenant, the difference between the Old Covenant and New Covenant prophet, I would say, is the level of intimacy of the New Testament prophet that really almost always is dealing with uh, a, a person's gifting, uh, a ministry's direction, a minister's direction. Uh, very seldom does it have a, a, a large national um, national implication. It does happen at times, but that's not the case typically. Um, the Old Covenant prophets largely functioned around the nation of Israel uh, and their cycles of 
walking in prosperity and blessing and obedience, falling into idolatry and rebellion, and then going into captivity. And that was their, their history. They seemed to go through that cycle over and over. So often the Old Testament prophets were uh, prophesying about, hey, this is the direction the nation's headed. It's going to be bad if we don't turn. And if we do turn, God can recover us out of this. Here's how we got to turn. Um, oftentimes the Old Testament prophet was uh, addressing specific issues with the king, uh, specific issues about should, this, should the nation of Israel go to battle against this other nation, uh, different things like that. And then the Old Testament prophets also functioned a lot in, uh, with messianic prophecy foretelling the coming of Jesus. So, uh, so my favorite uh, messianic prophecy is out of Isaiah chapter 9. It says, and this is 700 years before the advent of Christ. It says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Does that sound like Christ? It sure does to me. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end in the throne of David. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Yes, this was a messianic prophecy, clearly. Um, and so uh, another prophecy that has a great deal of application to the New Testament was the prophecy that Joel gave in Joel chapter 2. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, uh, Peter basically said, this is that which was prophesied by Joel. And he reiterates the prophecy. What was that prophecy? Uh, here it is. I'll read it to you. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward, I'll pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Well, this is when the Spirit was poured out. This is exactly what Peter was identifying with in this prophecy. But I want you to know there's also a futuristic tone in this prophecy that I'll identify with you. Let me finish reading it. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I'll pour out my spirit. I'll show you wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now, that is a key phrase right there. The great and awesome day of the Lord is a apocalyptic phrase that turns up over and over in the scripture. And so the, the day of the Lord is basically any day where God is coming in judgment in a consequential presence in the nation of Israel or amongst the church. And so the great, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. What is he talking about there? So he's talking, Peter identifies with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but then this future tense thing is identifying the day of the Lord that is, being, is basically being referred to as when the Roman Empire comes and conquers Judea. And they conquer Judea, they tear, they tear the city down block upon block, they tear the whole temple down, and the old covenant as it was known no longer existed. The nation of Israel that was piled up, the people of the Israelite people that were piled up in Jerusalem as it came under siege were killed, and over a hundred thousand of them were taken captive as slaves by the Romans. And the temple was completely tore down. Uh, not one stone was left upon another. Does that sound familiar? It should, because it's a prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 23 and 24. It's also referred to in the book of Mark and Luke when the disciples were admiring the, the fabulous buildings of the Temple Mount, and Jesus goes over, I think it was on the Mount of Olives, and they're looking back over at the Temple Mount, which is also called Mount Zion, as Joel says. And he said, basically, in not many days from now, um, there's not going to be one stone there left upon another. And the disciples were absolutely dumbfounded. It's like, what, when will be the time? When will be this happening? When, when's this going to happen? And he, he said in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that all these things shall come to pass in this generation. And so we know that 40 years later, roughly, 70 AD is when the Romans came under General Vespasian and laid siege to the Judea 
and they took town upon town, and as they did, it pushed all the populace into the walled city of Jerusalem. And then they locked up the city of Jerusalem, and no one could come and no one could go. And the the, the Romans uh, invested, the, you know, did what's called an investment in, in battle terms, uh, dig, dug a trench all the way around the city, walled it in. They had catapults all the way around it, and basically they just buttoned up the whole city. No one could leave or no one could come in. But before that, many of the Christians who understood this prophetic word of Jesus had already escaped. And so let's look with that in mind um, at the prophet Joel. It says, It will come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so that they, those who heeded this prophetic word by Jesus that was also passed on through to the disciples and the apostles, uh, many of them escaped. It says, For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. And so uh, if you read the, the writings of Josephus, this perfectly um, corroborates this story. But the Romans uh, surrounded the city of Jerusalem and laid siege to it for, for a long, long time. And it said that over a million people were in the city. Many of them were killed and about 100,000 were taken into captivity as slaves. And so this battle was started by the emperor Vespasian, I'm sorry, the uh, the general Vespasian, who later became emperor of the Roman Empire, and the battle was finished by his son, the Roman general Titus, um, and then uh, was was uh, totally destroyed. And this started under the emperor Nero, but pretty soon Vespasian became the emperor. Later on, Titus became an emperor, and then his brother Domitian became an emperor. So, again, this is all very, very, very relevant um, to Bible history and the destruction of Jerusalem. So, so let's go back now to an expression of the New Testament prophet. We have a guy by the name of Agabus that shows up a couple times in the book of Acts. And so I want to show you an expression, just one expression of a New Testament prophet in uh, the, the book of Acts. Verse, uh, Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 25, it says, So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, who we also know as Paul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, for a year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. So not only a prophet, but prophets, plural. One of them was named Agabus, who stood up and foretold. Here's a prophetic expression, right? A foretelling prediction. He foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over all the world. And that term world there is, I, I haven't looked at it, but it's probably the term oikomene in Greek, which means the known world, not the earth like the globe. Uh, this took place in the days of Claudius, Emperor Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And so based on the prophetic word that came forth uh, from this guy by the name of Agabus, a prophet, come from, uh, came down from Jerusalem, they uh, basically prepared for this coming famine. And history does tell us that this did happen in the days of Emperor Claudius, Claudius was the emperor that came after Caligula, but just before Nero. And so, uh, so that's in Acts chapter 11. And then in Acts chapter 21, we see another time that Agabus pops up here. But he also pops up amongst uh, the names of a few other ministers that were uh, people that functioned in the fivefold ministry of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Uh, in Acts chapter 21, verse 7, it says, uh, they, they had finished the voyage from Tyre and arrived in Ptolemy and had greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. The next day they departed and came to Caesarea and there they entered the house of Philip the evangelist. So here's a, an expression or an evangelist that pops up. Philip is also the evangelist that um, is referred to with the Ethiopian eunuch that he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch uh, who was reading out of the book of Isaiah in, um, in Israel. Philip the Evangelist, who, ha who was one of the seven, one of the original seven deacons per that we referred to earlier in the book of Acts, uh, they came to his house and stayed with Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and they stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied, so they functioned in the gift of prophecy his daughters did. While they were staying for many days, a prophet by the name of Agabus came down from Judea, same guy that we saw before. 
And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own, his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. So here we have the prophet Agabus who takes Paul's belt from him, ties his hands and feet, as a prophetic act and as a prophetic sign to Paul foretelling that when he goes to Jerusalem this is what he can expect if he follows through on that trip and so they begged him not to go so they said this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man bind the, bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles what Gentiles is he talking about the Romans because we know later on under uh, Nero the Roman uh, Emperor Nero Paul and Peter both were executed um, in Rome. And so, so again, here the prophet Agabus is foretelling something that is coming to pass. Now, I've heard some kind of make the argument that Paul should have listened to the prophet and not gone to Jerusalem and ended up getting um, killed in Rome. But that's neither here nor there. We don't know whether that's the right thing or not. Um, but, you know, this may have been a warning that he could have heeded and continued on in his ministry. But we know later on, as you go back to the end of the book of Acts, where Paul is in Rome, he's renting a house, he has a Roman guard that's there with the house, but he's got quite a bit of liberty. He's under house arrest, but people can come to him. And it says that he, people did come to him frequently, and he taught them about the kingdom of God. And so, so these are some of the expressions of the prophetic ministry. The prophetic ministry is an foundational ministry to the church very very vital ministry we need the prophetic ministry just like we need modern day apostles and so i hope that uh, this kind of wrap up will give you a good uh, idea good handle on the prophetic ministry i've seen prophets who function in many many different ways and i'm so thankful that the prophetic is uh, becoming more and more welcome in the church and is maturing more and more uh, we've had some fantastic prophetic uh, ministers in our lives that have helped, been, helped give direction to our lives and to our ministry. It's very, very helpful. And so I hope that uh, this has helped you. And um, please share these messages and uh, learn on your own and do your own study to verify these things.